Hello, Perf Bites listeners. Before we begin, please take a moment to listen to a word from our sponsors. Want better answers? Use better data. After years of struggling with old tools and practices, today's performance practitioners need the ability to optimize modern applications. They need the flexibility to use tools wherever they best fit with seamless integration that makes every engineer more effective and valuable. That's where Sosta comes in. Sosta's load testing flagship product, CloudTest, delivers actionable intelligence that lets your performance test team drill into live data to pinpoint any performance issues. Leading brands like Nordstrom, Best Buy, DirecTV, SAP, and MSN have all turned to Sosta to simulate more realistic traffic for load and performance testing for web and mobile apps at any scale, anytime from the cloud. Use predictive analytics to determine whether optimizing your site will provide enough ROI to justify any suggested changes. CloudTest gives you complete load testing flexibility from development to production. And let's talk about Sosta's Mpulse. It's the leading real user monitoring technology for better insight into your real users. Mpulse allows you to accurately monitor your customer's experience and take control of your business results. See how performance affects user behavior in real time so you can optimize in real time. The analytic capabilities found inside Mpulse will astound even the most senior operations engineer and also leave your executives drooling. Impulse delivers the rich visualization and real user data essential to their decisions about global application performance. Sosta's Cloud Test and Impulse can instantly transform your application performance practices into a world class operation. Learn more at www.sosta.com. It's time for Perf Bites. The fourth square meal of the day. Don't bother with perf bites. Waffles. Microwave ready. Add nutritional value to your brain. It's time for perf bites with your hosts Mark Tomlinson, James Pulley, and Howard Chorney. Perf bites. Whatever. It's tools, tools. Yay! Tools, 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 tools. Hiya, kids. Hey, I'm just a tool guy, I'm just a tool guy, I'm just the tool guy. It's time to talk about the tools. Woohoo! This is really exciting. Welcome to Epi Tool Tool. It's very you guys are very excited about the tools. Well, you know, every, it's, all, it, 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 it's it's one of those things that separates uh, you know, your 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 intelligent hominid tester from your non-intelligent and uh, non-evolved hominid tester. Does it separate the child the child units from the adult units? Um, that could be the organic carbon-based life forms. You betcha. Uh, um, ha- having having a, a posable uh, silicon unit so uh, helps as well. You know, be able to grasp the tools as well. <laughs> well, welcome to episode sixty-six of Perf Bites. Is episode sixty-six? My wife was born in. Get your kicks. You can get your kicks on Route sixty-six. Yes, you can. That also as well. That's very exciting. Um, and, and in fact, I believe Ben Simo spent some time on old Route 66 this last summer. Oh, good for him. That was yes, really nice. Yes, Mr. Simo, listener to Perf Bites and performance tester extraordinaire. I wonder if he filled up at the Phillips 66 station. But welcome to episode 66 with your copiously recumbent hosts, Mark, James, and Howard, who are singing about tools and bringing you this listener-focused topic about tools because we're responding to this request from the recent... Perf Bytes listener survey, which continues to go on, right, James? Yes, sir. That's right. So um, almost every talk that I give, I just gave a talk uh, in New York, and um, sure enough, you can you can be talking about performance mistakes and requirements and expectations and how we think and all this, all you know, my usual sort of abstract, crazy Mark kind of a talk, um, and inevitably somebody will ask you. About tools. Uh, uh, can I? Can I? Can I? Can I what? ask it, Mark? Uh, what tool do you use? Yeah, that's it. In the middle of a workshop where I'm trying to teach the basic principles around response time and time and volume and concurrency and throughput and all these kinds of core principles, mathematic principles, someone raises their hand and goes, "Well, can you talk a little bit about tools? What do I want to know about tools? What where, kind of tool? You know what my favorite tool is what? A hammer." Oh, sure. Because you can do so much with hammers. You can. You can do a lot. You can, you can, pe- you can peel a grape. A you can peel a grape with a, la- with a hammer. You can, like, 
mash a grape with the hammer. Fruit, too. you could peel a grapefruit or an orange. Yeah, and we get hammer, fruit. I think the hammer is the ultimate tool. Fruits, fruits, very important. So before we dive into this uh, tools of the trade talk, which is how we'll talk about how we're going to talk about tool talk, um, which is kind of cool. Um, we should, uh, at, like we kind of started doing, talk about um, the events that we're going to be at recently because there are three upcoming events that are uh, really wonderful. Uh, James, you want to talk about the first one here, STVCon? Yes, sir. Here in early October, Mark, Howard, and I will be appearing at Fall STPCon 2015 in the Framingham, Massachusetts area. That's right. It'll be really fun. So we'll be the uh, very similar... Uh, in Perf Bites fashion, uh, very similar to uh, other shows where we do a QA and a and we give away a pair of awesome shoes. Um, it'll be on Tuesday night, as you said. And, and, um, and, and you want to know something, guys? What? As we locals say, if you can't find it in Framingham, you just don't need it. Yeah. I've, I've never heard that when I visited Framingham. Yeah. yeah. It's the truth, though. If you, can't, if you can't find it here, you, you just don't need it. You probably just don't need it. Um, the second event, which is coming in October, just a week after that, we're going to be down in Orlando. It'll just be James and I down at Dynatrace. But at the same time, we ho- we'll be doing all sorts of fun stuff. I'm teaching a half-day workshop. Um, we're going to be doing interviewing attendees. We're going to be giving, having giveaways, uh, doing a live broadcast, I think, Wednesday night. And, and, and don't forget spot mentoring. Spot mentoring, one-on-one mentoring. So while we're there, come hit us up. If you do want to do some Q&A, we can, we can help you out. That'll be really awesome. The not to forget about Whopper because Whopper is also happening in October. We just won't be there. Um, but go uh, look up uh, Andy Grabner, our good friend, is actually going to be out in uh, Palo Alto with the Blaze Meter guys. So and, that'll be and swell. Uh, Eric uh, Progler as well. Yeah, Eric's going to be out there, which would be swell. Um, but then we will, uh, James and I for sure, and maybe Howard, if you can join us. It depends us. if I get out of my, I have to give a lecture in Los Angeles on November 4th. Okay. So if I can get out to New York, I'll join you guys there. Yeah. Come, come spend a weekend. We'll be at Test Bash in New York, Test Bash NY. And, uh, and it's very important. Do not bring a hammer on an aircraft if you're going to New York. Yeah. Oh, not wait, no, you can, no, you can that. put it in your check-in bag. Don't just don't carry it on. Well, I, I, I find that it doesn't arrive uh, if you put it in your checked luggage. Yeah, that's kind of strange. Maybe they're short on hammers there in the TSA. I don't know. Maybe it was the fact you put a 14-pound sledge in there, which made the bag a little too heavy for the baggage handler. Perhaps if you'd used a smaller hammer, like a baby sledge, but more you, important, you would have gotten in. More importantly, in the event calendar, recently, Howard had a birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Howard. Thank you. It's my 29th annual 29th birthday. What's 29 plus 29? Let's see. That'd be like 58. You got it. Yeah. So you're not you're not 58 yet, though, brother. No, I really am, but that's besides the point. Wow. You're not, you're not actually 58, are you? <laughs> you really Get am. Get out of here. <laughs> I, didn't born, think, you, I didn't know you were 58 years old. Jesus Christ. I was born in 1957. I'm 58 oh, I kept, years I old. I kept thinking you're... Jesus, you're old. Yeah, no shit, huh? <laughs> Not, oh, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in things, my, it's all in my things mind. older than Howard. Fire is older than Howard. Fire is older than Howard. Yeah. Yeah. That that could that that might very well be. The wheel is older than Howard. Yes, it is. So let us dive into our subject um about tools. And I think the proper way to kind of kick this off is sort of describe um, the craziness that at least I keep encountering. You guys may encounter this, but I, I, I'm really left and kind of bewildered. Why are why are we all so obsessed with load testing tools? And 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 Mark, I think a part of that is after we cover why we're so obsessed is let's talk about why we haven't really concentrated on tools too. Good, good point. Good point. And not, not that we haven't, cause we do talk about tools all the time, but, but the, well, like, let's be reasonable. All right. To do our jobs today, we all know you have to be in the performance industry. You, you cannot do it manually. You have to use a tool. Right. So Howard, right. it's like you, a pure, it's pure, pure, 
uh, prerequisite. You're absolutely right. So here, I'm going to give you a challenge, Howard. What I want you to do is without any electronic automation tool whatsoever, I want you to tell me what is the CPU consumption on your laptop right now? I guess I could. No, I can't even do it without it. Well, I could go into Perfmon or... Well, again, that's a, that's a tool. Hey, you're right. It is a tool. Like I said, you can, just can't do it without it. Yeah. Oh, so, wait. Hold on. I'm going to, like, lick my finger. I'm doing this right now. I'm licking my finger. I'm trying to jam it in the USB <laughs> port to see if I can get anything. <laughs> get out your see multimeter. Get, yeah, see if I can get all... Hey, a multimeter is a tool. It's another tool. You can't do that. So, James, here's the same challenge for you. What I want you to do is simulate yeah. 4,000 users on the website without using a load generation tool. Oh, I love this exercise. Okay, so I need a small basketball arena. I need a lot of laptops. <laughs> We're going to need to order some pizza, some beer. I need a lot of college students. Well, we can't give them too much beer before the test is actually conducted because then the test won't be kind right, of... The test may be more entertaining after the beer. That's exactly. Well, that, that, that's true. And, you know, we're going to give them, you know, all different sheets of paper that have these business processes and little bits of data that they all get to use. And, and everybody's going to get a stopwatch and we're going to run through it. Everybody's going to collect all their response times consistently and they're all going to use it all consistently. And then we're going to run this one test and... And, and then we're going to do the, re they're going to give all the results to me and it's going to take me a week to analyze it. And then we're going to come back and we're going to do the test again. And it's going to be exactly the same. Oh, exactly. In the Mercury days, we used to call it the pizza party, right? That's exactly right. So one of the reasons we are totally obsessed and I totally get this, even though sometimes I, I'm pretending I'm surprised by it. We, you can't be a load tester, even just, you know, basic performance testing, load testing person without a test tool. Now, a functional tester, different than functional testing, you could do functional testing usually, you know, in a non-automated way. I you can still you test functionality. Some, I think you need some, you know, I, I almost beg to differ, and, and maybe I'm off base, <laughs> like I haven't been before, but um, I beg to differ. I think you still need a tool to do manual functional testing. <laughs> I, I, and I think you do. In, 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 in what's that? How are you, you going to do your data load? How are you going to do your data load to do your functional testing with? I mean, you could have data to functionally test with. So at least you need a tool with that, unless you want to do all. Your, unless you want to do manual data load. Oh, oh, well, you know, we're just we're just going to take a, we're just going to take a snap of production. Yeah, there you go. That sounds right. But the idea being, um, in a modern world, even there are some things that in the in the past people were able to do manual functional testing, we've never been able to do the 4,000 user concurrent test without some kind of the virtual user technology or a driver. We've load testing, let's face it, you, like you said, Howard, you can't do it without some kind of a tool. And that's partially why we're, we're, we're obsessed with it. Now, the other thing is, um, like the CPU example, Howard, even if you're doing load testing with a tool, there's still a lot of people that have load generation tools, but they're not monitoring. There's a whole other part of the tools like Perfmon and StatD and all these other kinds of things that will get you all of the uh, monitoring and all the other parts of those tools. There are uh, outside of load generating tools. There's all these other tools that people are like, well, I got halfway there. I got this tool and I got that tool. But what else do you use for X or Y or Z, right? So it's always like a never-ending conversation of this endless array of tools. And endless march of tools vendors. Yeah. Yeah, yes. that's true. Um, there, there is a rich, rich history. Now, James, you and I both spent our time uh, early on working with Mercury Interactive. We both worked at Microsoft. Um, yeah. And we both in some way, shape, or form worked with HP in, in the later, in the more recent years. Um, but there is a rich history of these load testing tools um, that have changed hands over the years through different companies and different competitors. But I, I know a couple of salespeople that have been a salesperson in almost every testing tool vendor that came along. Because a lot of nepotism in that industry. It, it, nepotism or specialty, right? I mean, it's like, look, if you got a, want a guy to tell the ROI of load testing performance and APM, you get a good solution sales guy that really understands that you're never going to let that person go. I mean, they're going to stay in that industry, right? Yeah, but but Mark, uh, let's let's face it. If your sales guy shows up driving a Bentley, <laughs> that's a hell of a sales guy. Which which actually happened at uh, Mercury Interactive uh, uh, for a short period. Um, 
maybe you want to negotiate more aggressively. Oh, the wild, wild west of stock options. That was fun. Um, but there's another good reason that we're, we really see with younger generations. And actually, I say in the last two events I've done where people ask about tools, they seem to be younger people um, and they're getting started in their career. I think it still may be true that they're looking to, I think, Howard, as you stated here, it, it looks good on the resume. You pick a popular tool. Um, and of course, they ask a guy like me because I've seen all these different tools and I'm supposed to be in touch with these things. But I think they may be asking because these kinds of certifications or really learning a specific tool is the key to their future career. Now, is that any different now than it was 20 years ago? I, I think it is as as the larger commercial tools have become more diminished in the market for, for whatever reason. And um, practices have mm -hmm. changed. That is, we're pushing tools more towards developers and less towards uh, dedicated uh, software um, testers to do performance testing. <clears throat> is th both the tool feature set has changed yeah. and the nature of certification has changed. It used to be that certification established a baseline set of knowledge for the tester. Let's be honest, certifications have been cracked and they no longer provide that as yeah. a demonstrable um, measure of value of the user of the tool. Not just in load testing, in, in lots of different ways. A absolutely, across the industry. I've definitely witnessed that phenomenon too because you'll have people take tests, a certification test, and you'll have four people take the test and by golly, all four people got the same score. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, talk about the cracking of it. And, you know, I just want to do a comment back on another point you made, James, when um, a while back when I was running a really large organization, it, I looked for developers to do the, my performance testing. I did not look for people with just solid test background. I looked for people with development background. Or some diversity in their background, especially technical diversity, yeah? Yeah, well, you know, I think it's important because you, you're dealing in one particular tool that had a lot of different protocols to deal with. Some of the protocols were uh, remarkably more difficult to code and script in than others. So you needed that development background. Yeah, so I think the need is still there, and there's still testers who are getting into performance who are saying, all right, the first I, since I know I need a tool, I might as well start there with the questions and, and I can start read, if I learn a tool, I can get a job. Um, but really what's going to give them a long-term career is learning everything else they learn on the 65 episodes of Perf Bytes that deal with how you think and how you plan and how you deal with everything else. Um, that said, um, why, James, why do you think, you know, up until recently, uh, until now, why, why is it that we haven't gone deep into the tools discussion as PerfBytes. This harkens back to our mission at the beginning of PerfBytes. There is an, a very rich set of foundation knowledge and foundation skills which are essential independent of the tools that you're going to use, whether you're using Grinder, JMeter, Sosta Cloud Test, uh, Load Runner, Borland Silk Performer, Rational Performance Tester, um, um, you know, any other tool in the market. And, and I'm sure there are some that I just missed and everybody's going to be upset, but, you know, they pop up every day. They, they go away every day as well. I mean, this is a very dynamic market in this case. And those tool skills, those non-tool skills, the non-tool knowledge set that, that, in my opinion, takes anywhere from 85 to 95 percent of your actual project skills for any given project, those need to be constant and those need to be refined. Those need to be um, encouraged to grow. Yeah. And that is where we have kind of pushed um, Perf Bytes as a broadcast, but we're being told by you as a community of listeners, hey, we want a little bit of anchoring over here in the tools too. We want we want you to flesh it out. So we're trying to find the balance point, I guess, and, and this show is a good starter for that. Yeah. Now, we did do episode 37, which was you and I hemming and hawing about what we think the future of next generation test tools should be. And um, I think that's where most of the product managers 
uh, from all the tool vendors probably listen to that show over and over again because I keep seeing features that we came up with. They keep showing up in these tools, and I don't know. Nobody's taking me out to dinner. And uh, I, I'm, I'm the same, Mark. Yeah, same. No dinners. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. generous. I, I've done I've done the product management thing. So I, I'll I'm, take you guys out to dinner. Okay, thanks, so. Howard. That's nice. Oh, cool. Yeah. Woo dinner. Woo-hoo. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, most of the dysfunctions, whether you're a load tester or not, because we have people that are product managers and QA leaders and IT directors and ops guys and developers that listen to the show, and a lot of the dysfunctions have nothing to do. With a test tool, I gave a talk uh, just last night uh, in New York, just generally going over all of the different things that can go wrong in your testing. And almost the the overwhelming majority of them had nothing to do with like a tool failure. I think one of the stories was a tool failure. Um, But really it was, uh, you know, just it it, it was human error uh, underneath everything. So I think you're right, James. It's really those dysfunctions. Now, let's not forget... We obviously have sponsors. Howard Sosta is our sponsor. Their primary business is creating the wonderful tools that help people do what they do. SmartPair was a sponsor. Flood.io, Tim Koopman's, our good friend Tim Koopman. HP. So HP's marvelous supporter of the show. Um, we, we, as, as we point out, you cannot do this job without the tool. So the tool is an anchor skill set. That's more of a mechanical skill, whereas what we tend to discuss more often is our analytical skills. Yeah. So, you know, one thing I always like to say is just because you can use a tool doesn't mean you're a performance engineer. That's ex- absolutely right. And I think we do we do make a good delineation between people who might call themselves a tester, a performance tester, and a performance engineer. There is a little delineation. There certainly isn't salary. But you learn a broader scope of value and, and skill as well as using more than just a load testing tool, and you start being able to call yourself a real engineer. Well, you have um, to understand that load testing is a, in for sense, and somebody yelled at me once about, I'm using a marketing term by saying this, but you know, it's a program, it's a discipline, right? You have to have a, a performance testing program in place. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a practice, a dojo. A practice, you there yeah. you go. You, you are writing code to test code. Yeah, and so it takes uh, it takes a real engineer to figure out how to do that, and we're going to talk more about that in a second. the uh, The real number one tool, and the 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 kind of flippant remark that I say to a lot of people when they ask me, "What tool do you use? What's the mo- what's the best tool? They the best? What's the best of any? There is no best tool. The best tool that you can learn for performance engineering is your brain, and figure out how your brain makes sense of systems of time and response time, how you make sense of uh, concurrency, all the things we've talked about on Perf Bytes are how you think about this. If you master the thinking, learning another tool is a walk in the park. It's a piece of cake and, if you I, get those ideas. Well, that's all there. it is too, Mark. It's learning another tool, right? It's like, oh, I know how to use this hammer. Now I'm going to learn how to, when I, you know, I'm going to use a framing hammer to frame my house. Now I have to do my finish work, so I'm going to use my... Framing hammer. Finishing hammer. <laughs> Finishing hammer, exactly, right? So, so, so Mark, uh, Howard, I get this question all the time in public forums. What's the best tool for? Exactly. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll be back in just a moment to, to take a look at that common question right after a word from our sponsor, Light Square. LightSquare.com is proud to be a sponsor of PerfBytes. LightSquare.com is a unique offering for performance tuning as a service for web architectures. LightSquare delivers tuning recommendations in under 72 hours without the typical investment in tools, license fees, or consultants where we do the work up front. With LightSquare, you only pay based on the level of improvement. Find out more about LightSquare's unique pricing model at www. Dot L-I-T-E square dot com slash pricing. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I get asked all the time, what is the best tool? And it really changes from customer to customer based upon your reporting needs, your monitoring needs for analysis, yep. what you're trying to test. Yeah. And most important of all, what skills does your team have? 
Yeah, those are good general things. Like if you if you um, if you pick up a tool and let's say you're a Java shop and your test tool is written in ANSI C, like load load runners. A lot of guys that are like, oh, I know Java, but you know, I don't want to. I don't want to learn C. I don't want to do. Blah, blah, blah. But yeah, because that, that whole Java thing that's for like failed. Yeah, server. and vice versa. You go to you go to a .NET shop and you show up with something like JMeter, and they're like, well, we don't really trust your tool. And believe me, the reason we don't talk about the tool is that that trust is more important than the specific tool. But that's one of my favorite things in the world when people try and blame the tool for their pro. Oh, the site didn't work. It's got to be your tool. Hey. Uh, th- uh, th- there's a chorus that goes along with that. Do you want to hear it? Yeah, I'd love to. Blame the tool. Blame <laughs> the tool. Blame, blame, blame the tool. Oh, Spe- sorry. Speaking of blaming the tool, episode 34 of Perf Bites is entitled Blame the Tool. Oh, well, that's all wonderful. Uh, Go back that, and listen to that one. Go back and listen to that one. It's fantastic. Um, but that's the idea is that um, we, as we've taken this departure, we forgot uh, to some extent that's like, all right, let's 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 loop back and really, if you can build that trust and now you really are trying to make a decision about what is the best tool for you? You need to break it down into a couple different categories, um, kind of like we have in the past, but let's sort of reiterate those here. I think the number one question when people say, what tool should I use? They're really looking are at that primary category of load, you know, test script creation, load generation, and, you know, running a load test. The load runners, the semantic, that load runner, a controller, virtual user generator, maybe an analysis tool built in monitoring built in that semantic um really kind of set the 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 main uh schema for a load testing tool in load generation it does mo- most of these tools you look at cloud test light you look at load runner now it does so much more than just load generation because we've got 20 years worth of evolution uh built into these tools and yet still james we see Grinder, JMeter, which kind of do pale by comparison. They're like, this is a do-it-yourself tool. There's not a lot of recording features here. But well, you do get what you pay for. And this is since you have tools vendors who are investing literally millions of dollars into the development of their tool. Yeah. Right? And then you have your open source tool. Well, guess what? Open source. Duh. Software, software for profit is immoral. Software for profit is immoral. But... Uh, Disregard that I work for an e-commerce vendor. How did you buy? How did you buy that house that you own? Yeah, exactly right. Uh, part of the idea is that a company is going to pay for it in many ways. You can decide to have someone else build your tools, and the people on your staff don't become. They stay focused on your business. They stay focused on the customer, and they're not a tool shop. One of my Doug Hiller was one of my managers at Microsoft. Has said, "Look, we are not a tools team." We use commercial tools because that's not our expertise in the market. That's not what Microsoft does. Microsoft had a bunch of do-it-yourself tools internally. Yeah, they actually productized one of them. Uh, several of them, several right? Of them. Yeah. yeah. And But the idea was when they were scrub tools internally on the toolbox, you if you did an engagement with a customer and you spent half of your billable hours just messing around and getting your tool to work, that's a failed value. That's a failed approach. So the idea that you're trying to choose a tool nowadays, the free and open source thing, as we can see, they're free and open source is free like puppies. Like here's a free puppy. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) isn't it cute and cuddly and isn't it fun? What do you mean I have to get shots for the dogs and take it to the vet every year? Oh, shoes. I got to feed feed it. it, Yeah. And depending on the type of dog, there may be some more dirty work you have to do every day to keep the dog healthy. Oh, and let's let's talk about some of the breeds with some of their health issues, right? Like any dog like with smushed in noses, they're going to get respiratory problems. But we didn't tell you for that. We didn't tell you that when we give it to you for free. Yeah. So before we dive into these deeper categories, I'll say, think, keep in your mind, are you looking for a tool that you can help help you learn? And in some cases, there's not a lot of money for learning. There's You may pick up a free and open source tool just because you can learn the concepts and then, you know, but is that really the ticket that gets you into the next gig to learn Cloud Test or Neo Load or Load Runner that's going to get you to the next step? So the nice thing is a lot of the vendors, the Cloud Test Lite came out with uh, as 100 virtual users for free. You got the community edition of Load Runner that comes out for free. And I think most of the 
the tooling uh, vendors have followed for load generation tools, there is a community edition of some sort now that you can get off the ground. You can learn the scripting. You can learn the scenario creation. You can learn how to get that stuff built. So it's not like the old days where it's like, well, I have to use a free tool just to learn, but then that doesn't get me a job. You know the beautiful thing about those tools, too, are you know, those uh, light versions and community versions and things like that. Yeah. It actually encourages your developer to do their own performance testing because they have a free tool. They have a free load testing tool they can use. And by the way, hopefully it's the same tool that they're their performance engineering groups using. So there's some consistency from top to bottom. Yeah. Now, the other thing, James, that I'll throw out here to you is keep, remember the, 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 the criticism of testers. Testers don't know how to code. But when it comes to performance testers, you have to learn how to code. Because as you stated before, uh, you're writing code to test other code from a performance perspective. And every one of the load generation tools has some kind of scripting language built in, right? It, it does. And the the users of these tools have changed markedly over the last two decades. If you look at, say, a load runner, it's a C-based tool. If you look at um, Silk Performer, it's Pascal. If you look at Grinder, I think it's Ruby or something of this nature. You've got JavaScript, which is now a part of Load Runner. It's, it's a part of NeoLoad. It's yep. a part of... So is to cloud test. Uh, you've got Java, which is a part of JMeter, and you've got other shell scripting languages that can plug in as well. Yeah. So you, you really need this as a core foundation skill as a developer. However, when we look over the last decade in particular, as we've moved towards less expensive performance testing outsourcing, those individuals are coming right out of school. They tend not to have mature development skills, which leads to a lot of inefficiency, no matter which tool you're using. And then they get promoted to be a developer um, later on when their skills mature. So you're not able to capture the mature skills that we did, say, 20 years ago or even 15 years ago, where we went out and we hired very mature individuals. Or Howard, like you, you you were saying about your experience and, and going and getting developers who have who have seen some of these interfaces that you're going to use for performance testing prior to actually building performance tests. They've seen a Winsock. They've seen a database um, styled connection that needs to be performance tested. They've seen web, they've seen telnet and they can leverage that as they're building code to test code. Absolutely. You know, another big thing too is, and especially in uh, cloud tests, there's really ability to do uh, Java custom modules to really expand your test capabilities and to go after some really hard transactions. So you may be looking, missing out on an opportunity to make your tests more robust and to increase your coverage. Yeah. Languages are at the core of these tools, not only because, well, hey, you need flexibility, but you're going to encounter things that the tool manufacturer never anticipated. They'll be in the field for a long time, and the languages are there because the tools then are extensible. And just remember, uh, the techno technology keeps expanding too, right? And new languages are developed, and there are new ways and methods to code and things like that, so... The tools have tools have to keep up with that too. Yeah, and it's the double-edged sword when we keep going back to the free and open source world. That's like, all right, if I if there's some brand new technology and my testing tool commercial vendor isn't ready to support it, this was a big criticism of us at at HP when I worked there. It was like, wow, when are you going to support X or when are you going to support Y? Um, and, and sometimes there's a really important customer that's on some edge case technologist like, I want you to invest a million dollars to support this one-off technology. I was like, that's exactly what you're saying, uh, Howard, is you, you want to look at that extensibility to enable that or even find a partner to go build that protocol for you. Um, but that's kind of where tools have evolved. Back in the day, part of your definition as a load testing engineer or load testing performance testing analyst was that we had to, there was no recording. There was no recording capability for these things. You wrote all of the virtual user code by hand. That's in the way old days, like way old pre-95. Days. Pre yeah. And nowadays you've got multi-protocol recording plus multiple tier recording that's built in to give you whatever level of, of recording replay you want. 
um, everything from client side recording, uh, simultaneously grabbing stuff at the protocol level. So there's some really cool advanced stuff, but every one of these load generation tools, the whole process starts with scripting. You can go back to the Perf Bytes episode with Tim Koopman's about virtual user scripting, uh, which was really good. Very generic episode about any kind of tool, even though Tim was working for flood IO at the time. Um, and so these tools, again, load generation, there's a scripting language, there's a recording capability that, as you pointed out, Howard, is the script code Kickstarter. Um, and uh, that's a good way to think of it. It's like it's not, you can't just record and replay. You record and then you it helps you. No, you can't, Howard. <laughs> really sorry. There's more to the more to the oh, ball game than that. Jeez. Um, but you also, once you learn a tool, let's say you pick up LoadRunner and you're going to learn LoadRunner, LoadRunner supports... 30, 40, 50, some different protocols. You need to decide as an engineer, do I want to become like James Pulley? Am I going to become the Windsock recording guru or the .NET protocol guru? Or am I going to become a true client guru? Hey, hey, um, uh, if you're interested in Windsock, we have a club that meets once a year and they're really great jackets. Yeah. So, you know, I, I recommend Windsock. You yeah. actually have a jacket, James, for that? It, yeah, it's it's a green jacket. It it looks like the ones they get at the Masters, except we cut the sleeves off, and <laughs> and we put bite code on the back of it. It's it's really cool. It's kind of like this modified green uh, formal biker jacket. Yes, and there was a base sixty four question on the forums today. I saw you responded to. That's a good one. Yeah. So one area that we I think we're going to spend some time digging into in the future are these core load generation and main tools like a cloud test light like a J meter plus blaze meter kind of combo. Um, but even those tools have extended themselves like the main primary tools now have monitoring and results and analysis built in. We can even go and talk about some other, ex these extensible things. Like I think about Tableau. Tableau is a great uh, software for doing data visualization, uh, given a raw set of results. Let's say you see have J meter and you're not really happy with kind of the results. You want to pull that raw data in from a database and do some really fantastic visualization. Tableau, we could go talk to them. I don't know if you get, what are the other statistical tools that, that you guys can think of? Uh, certainly Splunk. Uh, it takes raw data and it, it can process it quite well. R is quite popular. Or if you have SAS um, or SPSS commercial tools on the statistical analysis side, those are quite popular for modeling and viewing results. And then we talk about some of the modeling tools out there, like um, High Performex, where you can actually see. Uh, but they got bought by CA. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we do see that these external visualization packages and external analytical packages, their use is more tied to the open source tools where the analysis is not so robust and not built in. So it's a very compartmentalized yeah. tool that I'm going to use it to build my test and run my test, but to actually analyze it, I'm going to need a plug-in tool set or a third tool set to actually do that work. Well, I always think you need it. And, you know, I kind of think you... I don't think the third tool set's a big a deal because I think you know, it's always advantageous to have a third tool set out there to do some comparison. And, you know, not every company makes, not every company is an expert in every tool. And I think it's worthwhile. But if you're going to have a, an array of monitoring tools, um, it, it's worthwhile buying a tool for an, that may be an expert in one area versus okay in all areas. Yeah, and, and as we look at the order of things in categories, I think there is something that f from an academic, like you have R and SAS and some of the other stats and visualization tools, there's an academic background when people come out with a computer science degree where you don't come out of your college, even a master's degree in computer science, knowing commercial-based load testing tools. And there's, you, you learn discrete components, you learn discrete ways of doing this, and they have a lot of other really professional, like SAS, totally robust professional statistical analysis and visualization suite of products. Um, the one key advantage I see that almost every load testing tool does well is to correlate the front end response times, the throughput and measurements from the front end with the monitoring and diagnostics on the back end. So well, no matter what tool you go to look at, 
um, there are two requirements. One, you need to be able to monitor with it and pull that data in because basically every tool, whether it's plugins or not, has to be able to do that. Um, so we'll talk more about maybe go deeper into monitoring and diagnostics tools a bit. Um, but I think that's an important thing to note that if you ha if the more you segment your tools, the more you risk not correlating front end to back end and, and correlating the real world. And that's a big risk in the storytelling of performance problems and problem resolution. So before we dig a little bit deeper into monitoring diagnostics tools, let's, um, let's take a little important break to hear about Perfbyte Serial. Hi, honey. I'm home. Hey, you don't sound too good. What's up? Yeah, not 100% today. My boss says I'm not performing at my peak today. Not performing at your peak? Feeling like you're a website that crashes on a daily basis? Perhaps you need to tune your system up in the morning with a hearty breakfast. The best way to tune your system is to start the morning off with a heaping helping of Perfbyte cereal. Perfbytes is the cereal for the adult on the go. Perfbytes are a little bit of performance goodness with the flavor of a wonderful single malt scotch that will get you up and running to start your day. Perfbytes contains 100% of your daily FDA nutritional requirements. Plus, it packs the punch of a single malt to make your day even more enjoyable. Just add some ice and woohoo, you're ready to go. Heck, even if you're having a sluggish day after the first bowl of Perf Bites, just have a couple of extra bowls and you won't care about the rest of your day anyway. Hi, honey. I'm home. Did you have a better day today? Heck yeah. Give me another bowl of those Perf Bites. Perf Bites, the official cereal of Mark and James. And if you're a teetotaler like Howard, try the new Perf Bites Light. All the flavor of our original Perf Bites cereal without the potential for the slurred speech. Caution, Perf Bites are not for anyone under 21 years of age. After eating Perf Bites in the morning, it is recommended that you either take the bus, take the train, or let someone else drive you to work. And remember, start your morning off with that delicious, nutritious cereal called Perf Bites. And and uh, and actually, I want to follow on what you said about this analysis side and being able to tell the story. Going along with that is the analytical side, being able to pull it all together and present it. That reporting piece is so very important and often overlooked in the rush to say, I need to generate load. How do I know on the back end or on the back end of the test when I report it, if I've actually met my requirement. Yeah. And, and I think also there's obviously from a commercial perspective or from the biggest investment from customers and companies to build these tools to where they are, there's a reason that we've brought all of this data together into a single solution, a single tool so that it fuels the telling of that story, the visual telling of that story, as well as being able to drill deep into the data and and also be able to tell a an architectural um, story to the people who are decision makers stakeholders and and people that assess risk especially risk to performance mm -hmm. for sure um, so think about the core load generation tool think about what other tools that I say are absolutely first tier have to be in your thinking if you do J meter and blaze meter you're going to end up using something like Loda Sophia don't do without it. I mean, you don't just do J meter by itself to generate load. And then you, you're not monitoring. If you're not monitoring, you're just really missing out on it. It's just ridiculous. Oh, but I'm running load. It's not good enough, Howard. We know that. I know that. I know you know that, but you know, the listeners might not know. That. Um, so then, and so what, what would you guys say are those core components? The ability to generate load, create a scenario of different workload profiles, uh, execute the load, monitor the test while it's running, um, collate the results, analyze those results, and generate a report that tells a story. Uh, that seems to be the core. All right. That's definitely the core. That's definitely the core. Then there's a whole, like we started talking about stats tools and some cool stuff. What other kinds of sort of, I'd say second tier, like, wow, you're Howard, you're really getting into do some more network infrastructure testing. 
what kinds of tools would you pick up for for network? Well, one thing I'd want to do is try and look for a uh, WAN emulate. If I'm doing a lot of internal testing within my lab and I have to understand the uh, the effects of the network on on my on my system, I mean, I'm going to be looking for a WAN emulation sure. tool set. What about just uh, being able to pick up your basic Unix utilities, um, TCP dump? I mean, you, you 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 don't necessarily have to get Wireshark, although Wireshark is also a, a wonderful. Plug. Well, there's another. There's I mean, so there's a great you know network monitoring and analysis tool, right? So the WAN emulation tools would be a different class from the Wireshark tool because WAN emulation is going to let you sit emulate what's happening on your wide area network. Well, you're going to look at Wireshark and it's going to tell you what's happening to the traffic as you're running it over that wide area network. That's right, and it's very useful in sort of what I would say gray or even full-on white box analysis, you can see every packet going back and forth. And every then you can, packet. And you can yeah, get a, a green the, jacket from James and, and his friends. And you can drill into the packets, too, and see what's going on. And you can do wonderful things like actually watch the conversation go by and look for, look for issues in the conversation. You can verify transaction markers. That's a whole other category we should – we haven't even – delve into yet but yeah so there's like sniffing tools there's emulation tools james i think we also have talked about ixia who has sort of infrastructural level or even layer two or low level load generation tools a absolutely especially when you get to things such as testing for streaming infrastructures voice over ip where you're attempting to measure uh, mean opinion scores for call quality if you want to test the load on your network actually independent of the application just to see what the network component of a response time is so you can avoid the dreaded, oh, it's the network's fault. Um, you can do that with those class of tools from Ixia, from Spirant, um, and, and I think even HP Agilent even has some, uh, some of those tools now. Yeah, absolutely. So this is how you're going to expand using the core load testing tool that we mentioned it's if you find yourself digging deeper into network infrastructure, these are the kinds of tools. TCB dump on Unix, just even Perfmon network monitoring if you're in Windows. Pick up Wireshark. It's cross-platform, cross so it, it can, you can actually learn quite a bit uh, using Wireshark in, in different platforms and, and sniffing traffic. Load emulation, as Howard brings in, is really, really important. Then if you really are loading just network infrastructure and base routes and switching and topologies... Look at look at Ixia for that. That would be cute. The next category we put out um, could be that, all right, you've dug into the infrastructure. You've analyzed a bunch of stuff happening. You've got monitoring. Um, you've got some diagnostics and profiling potentially. Um, but now you're being invited after getting the server and the network to scale. You find Steve Souders tells you once again 85% of the load problems or performance problems are on the client. Yeah, yeah. My my client is still slow. I, I think your tool is wrong. Yeah. So there's a whole different category than we use. Obviously, in News of the Dam, we do a lot of GT metrics, which pulls together page speed and why slow in a browse-hosted uh, solution. It's really nice. Um, I think of uh, the Shunra product, Howard, that we had that also well, was Network Catcher. Yeah, what Network Catcher did was Wasn't actually it? determined your uh, network characteristics. So you could plug that in and build your WAN emulation based on those characteristics you found in Network Catcher. But, Mark, another really good tool would just be, from a front-end perspective, would be anything that gives you a good solid waterfall diagram. Yeah. So you mm -hmm. can actually watch what's happening to the calls now when that's happening. So Shunry did have something like that, um, but it wasn't – it was passive. It wasn't active. And what I mean by that is you had to, like – you'd have to run your results before you could actually look at it. Now, looking at Sosta, we have a very dynamic um, front-end uh, waterfall diagram, so you can actually see things happening as they are, and you can watch each call, and you can find out what is taking, you know, what's blocking the call, um, what your DNS lookup times are, all sorts of things like that. And again, it, it, most of the tools, whether it's whether it's a cloud test light or Sosta, or you're digging in older tools or open tools like Charles Proxy I use or F uh, Firebug as one of them, even the developer tools built into the browser will give you a waterfall diagram. Th those are my favorite ones. Yeah, they, they and they're easy and everyone's got them and everyone trusts them. Um, again, the idea is everyone's got the basic waterfall diagram 
you can make it easier to work with it, but you have to learn sort of the mental game to analyze what it means. And that has nothing to do with the tool. You learn how to analyze a waterfall diagram. You can get any of these tools and you can tell a story. This is what the client's doing. This is what making it slow. Here's the grading system, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very easy Easy By the way, out there for listeners, um, the Souders, I highly recommend the Souders books. Totally. Totally. We're, we're like, big fans of Steve. Yes. And fa- yeah. he's still, uh, still out there uh, giving presentations, so check it out. I think there's even another book coming. There. Now, there's a couple other things like that are, again, complementary tools that make your, your more sophisticated, more mature load testing effort. The more you learn, the bigger you get. Uh, you're going to need some of these other things. Now, James, you wrote down here. Interface emulation. Yes. I think so wonderful. Let's think of a very complex testing environment where you have a large number of external dependencies, such as credit card processing. It's not always advantageous to in- incorporate uh, American Express into your performance test when you are paying for every single request that goes to them. <laughs> And you want to run a thousand hits per yes. second at five bucks a piece. Yeah. <laughs> so it might be to your benefit financially and in order to control your test, because it's not likely that your credit card provider is going to provide you a performance test interface either for testing purposes, that, that you should be able to emulate an interface. And that interface could be internal. It could be from your uh, web e-commerce site to your SAP environment. It could be external, credit card authorization, as an example. It could be anything. It, it could be. You could be emulating the database, although that's a little bit more sophisticated use of the tools. Yeah. Now, hang on uh, for a second, James, because you know, there will be a lot of functional QA folks out there that might say, oh, we have a sandbox environment from our vendor, and we can, we can run load on the sandbox. Ha! Ah, ha! Ah! <laughs> one, one, that vendor is going to charge a lot of money uh, per request. Yes. Uh, and two, or B, or, you know, Roman numeral two or whatever, um, it's not going to be sized for performance. Why would that vendor invest that substantial amount of money to size it for performance? Right. So having it a tool, does, yeah, so having a tool that's, that allows you to simulate those calls without having those calls ever leave the lab and and include the sophisticated, the great commercial tools. Uh, I think Lisa was one of the biggest ones to actually make it like a real going thing. Was hey, the, Mark, can I, yeah, go ahead. can I just make one comment? Sorry for being nitpicky no, on this. I apologize. I really don't think it's simulating it. I think it's it's simulating the answer back. It's certainly not simulating the call too. Um, yeah, the call is real. So you, it is more, you're right. So the difference between emulation and simulation is an important delineation here. I think if you build a, uh, and some of my customers call them simulators because it's, it's, it's doing the same thing that the real app would do. Uh, but it's, it's virtualizing the actual third party call. Yeah, cause, and just remember, you're still using your task script to physically make the call. Sure. And then Lisa's going to give you the expected result when you make the call to it. Yeah. And so HP's got a solution, and the category they call it is service virtualization, which is totally fine. We used to call it stubbing back in the day, um, but code stubs mean something different in the development world, so we don't want to blur the lines. Um, and, stub, and stubs didn't always supply an answer back either. No, they weren't. It was just sort of like a placeholder, right? Exactly. Yeah. One thing that I really like about simulators or, or emulators is the capability to set a maximum out-of-spec tolerance. Sure. That That is, I expect this to respond within three seconds or less. If not, then I need to make a decision. I can set it for my testing at that maximum out-of-spec tolerance and see how my system responds when that external dependency that I cannot control is operating in its worst possible state. Yeah, a, they can be used marvelous for, for disaster recovery and failover and all sorts of things. Yeah. Hey, you're doing WAN, you can do WAN emulation with it too, right? Because what you're doing is just delaying the response to what you think it's going to be when you make the call. Um, the last area we wanted to talk about, and James, I think you brought this up, was sort of request profiling. Now, that's different than bytecode instrumentation or diagnostics tools like Dynatrace, right? Yes. The very traditional view that you think of profiling is on the database, where we have a cost-based model for what is the most expensive 
uh, database SQL requests and then how we tune them. Well, this same concept of profiling can be applied to just about any type of request or process model. So if you look at something like a new relic or a Wiley Interscope or or uh, you know any number of other tools, you can profile what is the most expensive in the middleware tier, and you can even apply it to your web server. Uh, you can look at a cost-based model for what is the most expensive request on your web server that may not get to your middleware tier. Yeah. Now, in the in the Dynatrace world, they, they also have like hotspots. So you look at method hotspots, database hotspots, same, the different nomenclature, but it's basically extending uh, that, that same capability. HP Diagnostics is still out there as well. Let's move into part three. Howard, do you want to kick us off into part three here? You know, here's some things we were thinking of doing as topics moving forward. Um, one thing we'd love to do, we can do is like, you know, what do you all think about us doing one-on-one interviews with uh, tool, the tool makers themselves? We have a lot of, you know, we have a lot of connections in each of these tool makers, and you know, we can sit down with them and just discuss what they're doing. Tell us, tell us what their the 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 newest feature is. Tell us what uh, what the biggest challenge they see for the industry, and we just, you know, we could drill into not only the tools but really how they think. That might be very compelling. You know, another thing we can do, too, if people want to see us start doing it, is we can actually start reviewing some of these tools. People might be interested in three guys like us who have seen every tool under the sun uh, actually do some pros and cons. And, and you know, like anyone giving a good, fair review, a fair review should always include some of the things that are shortcomings. And every tool, every tool, even the the ones we might say are our favorites, well, there's things that they don't do well, and you know we we want to be able to give a, that kind of a fair assessment from people that have the three of us. I mean, geez, we've been doing this collectively for a hundred years, um, so that might be cool too. Now, what else? The other one of the other areas, Howard, that we talked about was just pretending that we're analysts, and then when we can actually invent our own little shape type thingy and place the tools and that particular shape, like maybe the... So, so we'll, we'll call that the, the impossible dodecahedron. Right. As Gartner came out with, with their um, geometric shape thing, and I, I think we do the terrible triangle. Uh, well, you know, maybe, maybe we come up with five different categories and we make it a, um, um, a, a, a cool hexagon or something like that, you know. And I kind of like the terrible triangle. Yeah, it's like the Bermuda Triangle. How about the ridiculous rectangle? Uh, the ridiculous rhombus. I was thinking maybe we could be moving. It could be the oscillating octagon. Yeah, yeah. that would be good. I think the other thing you could do is in the world of you know Facebook likes and dislikes and thumbs up and things like that. I wonder if we could do thing like you remember um, uh, Siskel and Ebert used to have you know thumbs yeah. up. Yeah, exactly. We, we could we could vote people like I give it three pancakes. Ooh, or waffles. Or French toast, because you made such Well, a, you know, Mark, French waffles toast. are not a good thing for perfect yeah, whites. Yeah, Mark, I, I pretty much remember that you had pretty much a phobia against waffles last time we had yeah, that waffle. I'm, I'm really discussion. against waffles. So we'd, we'd, we would vote. We would each be able to vote as the three of us. I'm going to give it uh, up to five pancakes. So anyway, these are some of the options. Um that we have moving forward, and, and I think we'd love your feedback. So send us a tweet or an email, um, if you will, please, uh, or even a voicemail uh, to let us know what you'd like us to do. Any interviews, any of these kinds of options, we're, we're wide open to do it, but we're definitely going to spend some more time getting closer and deeper in with, uh, with the tools of the trade. And, and a lot of this is captured in the survey as well. So if you haven't taken the survey, please go take the survey we can't close it out until we get a statistically valid sample set. We are not there yet. Please help us out. We want to close out the survey so we know so we know what you guys are doing. Yes. So, James, you want to repeat the URL for the survey? Uh, that would be surveys.perfbytes.com. 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 Call now. Well, Perfbytes listeners, once again, we are each very pleased to know that we are taking – steps towards meeting your needs as listeners of the podcast, bringing you all the details that you really need to become better performance testers. That's our mission. So thanks again for listening and uh, contributing your questions uh, on the future of the tools discussion. Hey, all, as always, thank you to the lovely Mrs. Chorney 
And of course, thanks to our listening audience. Without you, we are just looking for adventure. Da, 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 and whatever comes our way. Da, 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 da. Thanks again. And please tell your friends and colleagues about the show. Because remember, this is your show. Well, um, Mom, thanks for listening. And, and yes, Howard, he is okay. He's okay. He's a little odd. And I, li- and I like it that way. It's awesome. That's fine. I will, of course, give my thanks, uh, as always, to the uh, sexy Irish voice of Perf Bites, Dr. Martha, for, and also to our supporting sponsors, a tool company, marvelous tool company, Sosta, uh, for their uh, continued supporting sponsorship, uh, support of the Perf Bites show, and their support of you, the Perf Bites community. Mark? Howard, today's show is powered by African swallows. Not European, not American barn swallows, but European swallows. And all of the contents of this Perf Bites episode is 100% copyrighted and protected by the Killer Bunny. The Killer Bunny? What's he going to do? Nibble your bum? It's a killer hair. Exactly. For more information about the Perf Bites show, please visit the website www.perfbites.com or follow us on the Twitter, the Tumblr, the Facebook. And of course, you can always subscribe and listen to the Perf Bites podcast on iTunes, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, and testingpodcast.com. Just open your favorite listening app, search for Perf Bites, and click the subscribe button. While you're at it, why not give us a review on iTunes? That'd be swell. And you might not know it, but you can also send us an email at ask at perfbytes.com or even leave us a voicemail at 77 load perf. That's 775 623 7373. And Perf Bites listeners, keep those cards, letters, iTunes reviews, emails, faxes, and notes tied to slingshots a coming our way. The Perf Bites listener survey is still open and going. Don't forget to sign in and do take the survey so James won't remind you anymore. Bye. <laughs> the Perf Bites show and staff are supporters of the Practical Performance Analyst, the Performance Engineering Book of Knowledge, Test Bash, and the Ministry of Testing, the Computer Measurement Group, the Workshop on Performance and Reliability, and of course, the Software Test Professionals Community of Software Testers. We hope to see you at the next STP Con conference in October in Boston, near Howard's house. Please join us there for a live Perf Bites episode, great performance testing workshops and training, single malt scotch tastings, and of course, surveys.perfbites.com, surveys.perfbites.com, and surveys.perfbites.com. That's right, surveys.perfbites.com. Surveys.perfbites.com, where you can ride them, Jackalope. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening. And, of course, we'll see you at the next live event. Uh, or just catch us on the next edition of Perk Bites. It's a tools show, tools, tools, tools. Don't be a tool.